there are two explanations why Sheila Bowler's mind wasn't fully on the piano lesson she was giving. That's it for today. And for the journey she would make as soon as school was over. The police said she was setting off on a plan to commit the perfect murder. She says her mission was a simple act of kindness to an elderly lady. What was her motive as she drove to collect her aunt from this elegant Sussex rest home? Was Sheila Bowler on her way to care or to kill? There was no evidence to prove Sheila Bowler guilty or innocent of murder, but everyone in East Sussex has a view about it. Some are convinced she's guilty of a dreadful crime. Some, that there's been a terrible mistake. The historic town of Rye is one of the sink ports, five small towns charged since 1247 with the defense of the realm against the French across the channel. Sturdy towers stood guard over a port which in its Elizabethan heyday could anchor 200 ships. But then the sea retreated and left the clifftop cannons with only a marsh to guard. Romney Marsh, crisscrossed with trickles of drainage ditches, canals built to thwart the ambitions of Napoleon, and low-lying rivers like the River Breed. Step down. Step down. It was an early summer's evening in May two years ago. The car. Sheila Bowler picked up her late husband's aunt Flo from Greyfriars, the home in Winchelsea which looked after the 89-year-old lady. Gently down. Good. And then you will see then. Very right. The plan was for Aunt Flo to spend two nights at Mrs. Bowler's house in Rye, three miles away. It was a fine evening, and Aunt Flo enjoyed a drive, so Mrs. Bowler spent an hour or so on a detour to Bexhill on Sea. On the way back, Sheila Bowler says she noticed something wrong with the way the car was handling. Damn, 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 it's happening again. I think it's something to do with that wheel. Towards late evening, Mrs. Bowler rounded the hairpin bend at the foot of Winchelsea Hill. The wheel wobble she'd been worrying about became acute. She pulled up and put on the hazard warning lights. I think there's something wrong with the tyre, so I'll have to try and get somebody to help me. I think I'll just wait until those motorcyclists have gone by. Yes, I don't like to leave you alone while they're here. I'll tell you what, I'll try and get some music for you. Mrs. Bowler went for help to a house some five minutes walk along the road. I'm awfully sorry to bother you, but my car's broken down. It's Mrs. Bowler, isn't it? Y yes, yes. After phoning for help, Mrs. Bowler went back to wait for the recovery truck, along with the householder, Mr. Soane, and his wife. There's nobody. There's nobody in it. It's empty. Yes, she's not there. I don't understand this. She isn't there at all. She isn't. But this is ridiculous. She can't walk. Might have staggered. She must be somewhere near. Yeah. The whole thing is completely inexplicable. I've only been gone a short time, 20 minutes at the most. I went up the hill and asked these kind people if I could use their telephone. And, we and then we came back. straight back. Absolutely. And I mean, there's nowhere she could have gone. She's an old woman. She can't even walk without a Zimmer frame. After several hours, the police search had found no trace of Aunt Flo. 
even the helicopter had found nothing. It was only when daylight came that Aunt Flo would be found. She was floating in the waters of the River Breed, more than a quarter of a mile away from the scene of the breakdown. She was dead. It's the nightmare we all dread. We have to leave the children or an elderly relative for a few moments, and when we come back, something terrible has happened. But if Sheila Bola is innocent, then she has an extra dimension to her nightmare. What started as a car breakdown became a death in the family and is now a conviction for murder. For the Bola household, Sheila Bola and her son Simon and daughter Jane, it was the culmination of a wretched season of family calamities. Every time the Bola children came back to the prim and chintzy family home, there seemed to be more bad news. Well, it started in November of 1991, where um, Aunt Flo's sister, Aunt Lil, died of a heart attack. Then, in the so Aunt Flo was then left living the flat by herself. She then had this accident when Mum went round at eight o'clock one morning, later than usual, and found her. She'd vomited blood that either during the night or early that morning. Um, and then the following, she went, then went into hospital and into a home. And then in January of 1992, my father died very unexpectedly to everybody, including the doctors. Then um, on May the 13th, you know, Aunt Flo, Aunt Flo went missing and was found drowned. So that's, you know, over a period of six, seven months, three, four, three or four, Big events happened in the family. But to the police, this latest tragedy looked suspiciously like a drama Sheila Bowler had plotted in advance. From the start, it seemed Mrs. Bowler's behaviour had been strange. You know, I think that we should try Station Road. There's no point in going down there. I told you she can't walk. She's an old lady and she can't walk at all without a Zimmer frame. No it seemed she'd not encouraged the search party to range very far. She'd also, it was said, had a strangely dispassionate view of the night's crisis. When I rang up that night to speak to Mum, and I couldn't, almost couldn't believe how she was, you know, I was having a fit at the other end of the phone, and she was, oh, you know, it's quite jolly, it wasn't a problem almost, because it wasn't a problem, she'd be found, you know. I think in some ways we're very different. She just doesn't show her emotions. I don't think she ever has done, you know. When Dad died, she didn't then. But she wasn't one to show her emotions? Never. There wasn't an extra bed made up here at the house that night for Aunt Flo. There was no food prepared for her. Did Sheila Bola already know that Aunt Flo wouldn't be needing anywhere to sleep, anything to eat? The very next morning, police came to take away the car and check the tire. You can't take it away. I'm still pumping it up. That's all right, madam. I'll take care of it for you. They would later argue that it hadn't been driven while underinflated. In other words, the tyre must have been deliberately let down after it stopped at the hairpin bend. They could find no trace of the mystery motorcyclists who Mrs Bowler said had been loitering at the hairpin bend. And drivers who passed the stranded car at the critical time noticed something else that sharpened police suspicions. They said they'd seen the car with no one in it and Sheila Bowler was walking away. To the police, this could only mean one thing, that Sheila Bola was engaged in a cynical and heartless charade by going to look for help. Because the car, she had disabled herself by letting down the tire to provide herself with a cover story for a secret and sinister detour she had made earlier under cover of darkness. According to the police, Mrs. Bola had turned off the main road at the apex of the hairpin bend. She continued her journey down a lane called Station Road, driving her bewildered and helpless passenger past the safety of these cottages by a bridge over the River Breed, before curling round into open countryside. The lane leads down to Winchelsea Railway Station, but is little used after dark. About 600 yards on from the main road, there's a small piece of hard standing and a riverside water pumping station. The police believed that this was Sheila Bowler's lethal destination. 
for it was just 100 yards or so upstream of the point where the body was eventually found. The automatic pumping station was idle that night as Sheila Bowler wrestled the old lady out of the car and dragged her, because as everyone agreed she couldn't walk, to this steep embankment, from where she would meet her death in the waters of the River Breed. But amid the next morning's police activity, one clue to the night's turmoil emerged, one of Aunt Flo's slippers on the bank by the pumping station outlet, confirming for the police the very point at which she was sent to her death. The evidence of the first post-mortem offered a grim interpretation of that fatal night's events. The pathologist, Dr. Michael Heath, said he'd found bruises, grip marks on the upper left arm of Aunt Flo's body. He also said he'd found abrasions and bruises to her head and just by her eye, which he was later to describe in court as possible encouragement blows. The picture was painted of Aunt Flo being beaten and dragged, protesting to her death on the banks of the River Breed. The motive, the police thought, was money. Aunt Flo's bills at the residential home were mounting by the week. She owned a flat worth some £30,000, which Sheila Bowler stood to inherit. But the flat might have to be sold to pay for Aunt Flo to be looked after at Greyfriars, and that would leave nothing for Sheila Bowler. This is Aunt Flo's flat. This is the Bowler inheritance. This, apparently, is the motive why Sheila Bowler, a woman with her own mortgage-free home worth about £155,000 and an income of £15,000 a year, should decide to murder an elderly relative as a motive. It's something perhaps that a crime writer would have rejected as being a little on the thin side. But it seems to have satisfied the police. Sheila Bowler was charged with Aunt Flo's murder, but released on bail. At the best of times, a small town like Rye simmers with tattle and scandal, and with a murder suspect in their midst, gossip reached boiling point. But even her friends conceded that Mrs Bowler's manner could make her her own worst enemy. Well, she was an irritating bossy lady. <laughs> She, she, she always she talked like a machine gun at you, so you never wanted to stop very long for a chat. If you saw her, you tended to keep moving. Did you know her at all between the time that she was charged and, and before the trial? It was the one time, perhaps, that one didn't cross the street <laughs> the opposite way, you know, so because it wasn't quite as normal, and so you felt that it was important that she had support and, and felt that we weren't all thinking, gosh, you know, what a wicked woman. The defence team was confident when Sheila Bowler stood trial for murder at Hove Crown Court in June of last year. Whatever wry gossips might believe, none of the evidence brought to court linked Mrs Bowler directly to her aunt's death. And the case against her was in trouble from the start. The prosecution began by claiming that Aunt Flo must have been tipped in here, just above where her slipper was found. But when the jury paid a visit to the site, it was realised that that couldn't have been the case because Aunt Flo, in falling, would have hit herself against that concrete at the bottom there and there was no such injury on any part of her body. So then the prosecution had to come up with another plan and it's this plan which, it's fair to say, had some members of the court barely able to restrain themselves at the mirth of its absurdity. The plan was this. The scenario as outlined by the prosecution was that Sheila Bowler took her aunt down this precipitous slope, almost down to the culvert, then led her along this part of the culvert, the concrete culvert, across and down onto this mesh and concrete construction, along it, presumably coaxing Aunt Flo along until we get to the end here. And on the night in question, the river was about two feet lower than it is now. So according to the prosecution, Sheila Bowler goes down a little path here, jumps onto the lower concrete and mesh path, entices Aunt Flo down to the ledge and then when she's in a convenient position, pushes the old lady into the water. And all this done in pitch darkness to a lady who supposedly couldn't put one foot in front of the other. But what about those grip marks on Aunt Flo's arms? A second post-mortem conducted by the pathologist Vesna Jurovic challenged the assumption that there had to be a sinister reason for them. 
it is not uncommonly found in the elderly, especially in people who are in nursing homes and who are being taken care of in, in the course of routine work. Uh, very often in people who die of natural causes, you find a number of uh, bruises in these areas um, suggestive of these particular actions. What about the bruises and abrasions on the face? Their position, again, is in areas which would be exposed to injuring courses of a fall and there was really nothing in these marks to uh, make me believe that they were caused by deliberate blows. So on the neutral examination of the body, which, which you did, what you have seen is consistent with an old lady falling over, falling into the water, desperately trying to save herself by clinging onto something and eventually failing and drowning. That was certainly an acceptable explanation of the events uh, on the basis of the findings of the post-mortem, yes. The next piece of evidence to collapse at court was the matter of the tyre. The evidence that the tyre had been deliberately tampered with turned out to be worthless. The judge turned witheringly on the expert evidence in this crucial area of the prosecution and said that what he'd heard added nothing to the sum of human knowledge. Helen Goodwin might have added to the sum of human knowledge if anyone had bothered to ask her, with first-hand evidence that there was indeed a long-standing fault with the tyre. A sprightly 86-year-old, Mrs Goodwin had gratefully accepted a lift from Sheila Bowler two weeks before Aunt Flo's death. They'd gone to Hastings to buy her a hat for a wedding. On the way back, they stopped to admire the view. As she was going to start again, she said, I keep thinking there's something wrong with one of my wheels, but it seems all right at the moment. I shall simply have to take it to the garage. But let's get this straight. This is a couple of weeks or so before the night Aunt Flo disappears and yes. she is telling you there's something wrong with her car. I remembered the remark because as we were going down I thought, if we crash I'll never wear my new hat. Other evidence to tumble were the witnesses who, crucially, had said they'd seen the car empty and Mrs Bowler striding away from it. Cross-examined, they admitted they couldn't be sure. Halfway through the trial, the jury was sent out while the defence argued that there was no case to answer. The judge agreed that little of the case against Bowler survived. Even so, he thought that the jury had to consider one question. If Mrs Bowler wasn't responsible for Aunt Flo's death, who was? And it's this that convicted her. There is always the danger in cases of this kind that by concentrating on who else could have done it, one tends to forget, one forgets that the real issue is, have the prosecution proved that she did it? Now, obviously, there's a difference if the prosecution can show that there were only two people in the room, the room was locked, there was no access to the room, one is dead and the other one's alive, and it's clearly murder. Then, obviously, uh, one is entitled to take into account that if, if it isn't, it couldn't be anyone else other than the other person in the room. But here, there were other possibilities and it must be dangerous to concentrate on those other possibilities to the exclusion of the real question, has it been proved that it was her? Trial and error had to find some actual new evidence to cut through this fog of gossip and opinion. And the first thing we were to discover was the origin of the prejudice which has so compromised this case from the outset. Eight hours before Aunt Flo's body was found, the police, supposedly engaged simply in a missing persons inquiry, already had murder on their mind. There were and are no facts, no evidence to prove Mrs Bowler innocent or guilty. This is a case about prejudice. And the prejudice set in early. In the small hours of the morning, while the search for Aunt Flo was still in progress, the police logged a conversation with the woman who ran Greyfriars. I have spoken to Mrs Joan Dobson, the officer in charge at the home. She expressed great concern about the circumstances of the disappearance and was scathing on Mrs Bowler. Although she didn't openly accuse Mrs Bowler of doing harm to her auntie, she left me in no doubt that she thought it a distinct possibility. The log of the search helicopter pilot also sheds light on the unfounded assumptions that coloured the case from the outset. On returning to base, I was informed by the inspector that the woman was very rich, that the nursing home where she lived didn't trust the niece, 
and the car's flat tyre might have been a ploy. CID are making inquiries. Return to base was logged at 2.25 in the morning, more than seven hours before there even was a body. We discovered other evidence that the police were treating Mrs Bowler with suspicion again hours before the body was found. We retraced Sheila Bowler's travels on the fatal day, on the detour to the house in Bex Hill, where she'd driven with Aunt Flo after picking her up from Greyfriars. So, Mr Day? Yes. Uh, my name's David. She said she'd gone to Bex Hill to meet this man, Tom Day, to pick up the protein supplement she regularly bought from his wife, Jenny. Mr and Mrs Day have long been friends of the family. Both are convinced of Sheila Bowler's innocence and disturbed at the way police suspicion seems to have fastened on her within just a couple of hours of Aunt Flo's disappearance. I think it was about two o'clock next morning when the telephone went, waking us both up. It was the police from Rye. They said that they were sorry to wake us or wake me, but um, could I confirm that Mrs. Sheila Bowler and her aunt had called on us pre in the previous evening. You know, why should the police phone anyone up at two o'clock in the morning just to confirm information they've been given when the information that they were looking for from me could not help them find somebody who was missing? You both thought that this was rather strange that you should be woken up at two o'clock in the morning about a missing person. Mm. I think it's very strange. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't very happy about it. Sheila Bowler had gone to Bexhill to fetch that protein supplement on behalf of her friend, Helen Goodwin. Mrs. Bowler was that sort of a woman. I think Sheila came from a background of caring. Tell me about the sort of relationship she, she had with the aunts. Well, I mean, I think it speaks for itself. She called on them every morning to check up they were all right. Sometimes I think she took sandwiches in case they weren't feeding themselves properly. Can you understand how um, the staff at Greyfriars formed a slightly different opinion of her. I know, it's because she didn't go in and rush up to Aunt Flo and kiss her madly and hug her. I, I've had experiences of nursing homes and uh, didn't fuss round her and sort of said, oh, come on, Aunt Flo, you don't need a Zimmer. You get your stick and walk, you see. She, she wasn't a sort of sentimental, oh, no. gushing type. I don't she suppose was... she ever kissed Aunt Flo for a moment, you know, like some people do. There's nothing more that the elderly dislike than being kissed by people all the time. But this document, written by a policewoman sent to Mrs Bowler's home immediately after Aunt Flo's disappearance, paints a very different picture. Although part of this closely typed report seems curiously to have been blanked out, it's clear that the officer wasn't there to comfort a bereaved woman so much as to observe the behaviour of a prime suspect. She felt that she'd really been inconvenienced enough by the police over this matter. She was due to have her aunt stay that evening. One would have expected her to have had food in readiness. She also ordered the death of Mrs. Florence Jackson. However, she showed no signs of distress. But it seems that she just carried on making coffee and things she, Well, she would. I should have done, too. I mean, what else is there to do? You know, you don't realise what, the, you know, you, you take, listen to the words, but the full impact. And she was a very old lady, you're more or less expecting it. I mean, my husband was only in his 50s, and that was my reaction, that's all I can say. But it would be Sheila's reaction. She wouldn't burst into tears in front of the police, not Sheila, nor would I. In the days following Aunt Flo's death, women police officers were detailed to sit with Sheila Bowler, keeping vigil in the dark hours of bereavement. But much of her informal conversation about that night became the basis of a report which would be used against her. Mrs Bowler mentioned seeing motorcyclists on the hairpin bend, but the police couldn't trace them. She mentioned a walking stick missing from the car, which again the police couldn't find. But should the police have interviewed a key suspect without caution and with no lawyer present? Uh, if I am being interviewed over a few days, with someone taking notes of what I'm saying, perhaps over many hours, without a solicitor present, I may make mistakes. I may get things wrong. There is then the danger that when asked to sign the statement, it, is, it may accurately reflect what I have said, but that may not be accurate insofar as what actually happened. But by now, of course, the temptation to sign the statement becomes very strong. 
because if I don't sign the statement and start saying, well, no, I got that wrong and I got this wrong and that didn't actually happen, then I might feel that I am heaping further suspicion upon myself. Indeed, Mrs. Bowler, in her first uncautioned interview, admitted to a mistake she'd made about the shoes she was wearing. It was this sort of unguarded slip the police made much of when Bowler was at last formally interviewed. Under intense pressure, to every question, Bola answered on her solicitor's advice, no comment. That tyre was OK until such time as it stopped at the bottom of Ferry Hill, when someone let the air out of it. I mean, that's putting it in the vernacular. You let that tyre down. No comment. An old, vulnerable lady. There was no reason why she should have died like that. And you can give the answer as to why she did. Were you under pressure? Was it something that was said, done? No comment. Don't you think she deserves an answer as to why she died? Don't you think you owe Were it? Were you ever under the impression that she was soon to die? No comment. Mrs. Bowler, do you believe in euthanasia? No comment. What I'm asking is why did Flo Jackson have to die? Why was she killed? No comment. Andrew Sanders, you've looked at the full range of transcripts for us. Um, what's your general impression of this series of interviews? They're quite remarkable. The, the police display a very wide range of techniques to try to get the suspect to confess. They really don't seem to be interested in finding all the facts. They don't seem to be interested in the whole truth. Really, what they're, all they're interested in is getting their suspect to confess the guilt. What sort of tactics do they use? Well, they use a, a wide range. Uh, one of them is uh, a form of emotional blackmail. I mean, you just recently lost her sister, who recently died. Your husband had recently died. Did you feel some bitterness towards her? Meaning the aunt. Um, as we discussed on a previous occasion, your husband died under some sort of tragic circumstances. Do you feel bitter that your aunt is still alive? Was it something that triggered you off and you thought, I can't, this isn't right? They're offering a sort of emotional excuse for, for having killed her aunt then. Yes, they are. But, but to all of this, she answers no comment. What is inferred from the, from the no comment? What the police infer from the no comments in this interview is that she's guilty. And what they're trying to say to her is that her strategy of saying no comment means that everyone else will think that she's guilty. So, you're making no comment because you're guilty of this offence? No comment. What the police are doing here is it's quite legal, it's quite legitimate, isn't it? They've got someone in their sights and, and, and they want to get a confession out of her. Yes, it is quite proper for the police to try to secure a, a confession by lawful means. But what one would prefer them to do, what they ought to do, is to try to get as much evidence about the whole case, about the event, about the crime, before interrogating someone. What they're trying to do here is to take a shortcut and get the evidence through interrogating her. And that really is the big mistake. To make themselves seem a bit Those who know Sheila Bowler simply can't believe her capable of killing a woman she tended to do so dutifully. The friends of Sheila Bowler, like Carol Brigham and Sue Cutmore, who's known her longest, visit Bowler regularly. Her life in prison is a long way from the gracious lawns of East Sussex, but people like Liz Winch and Anne Wood still stand firmly by the friend they knew, a staunch Christian and a pillar of the local NSPCC. So the home team... Sheila Bowler, after all, they say, just wouldn't let you down. She, she always is the most, she is the most reliable person I've ever known, I must say that. When she says she's going to do something, she will, you know, she can absolutely yes. rely on it that she will do it. And, um, she's been a very staunch friend. And she told you everything, and that's what I find so absolutely stunning. If she had murdered anyone, we'd have known <laughs> she by now. Tell you. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's true. Oh, she, she could have known. She could not hide anything because no, no. I mean she is so open and so honest yes, yes. yes. and as you say this is not suffering fools gladly mm. I mean it was a case of if she didn't like something she didn't like it thank you thank you I think one kept thinking that as soon as they found out a bit more about Sheila they'd realize how ridiculous their line of questioning was Absolutely. but of course that didn't happen so often it is the person nearest who's involved but but those of us who know her well just felt that as soon as they started to make a few inquiries about her, it would be obvious that it just couldn't possibly be her. Mm.
the prosecution realised that putting Sheila Bowler's character on trial wouldn't get her convicted. They needed some forensic facts. But their professional efforts were worryingly amateur. However much they may have impressed the makers of this primetime television programme celebrating the police's scientific skills. OK, Debbie, thanks. You can take them off now. If Florence Jackson had... Give me one more. There was one piece of do-it-yourself science that the police and ITV's Crime Monthly were particularly proud of. Sheila Bowler had told the police a walking stick had gone missing from the car. If Aunt Flo simply fell in after making her own way to the riverbank with the help of a stick, would it float away or stay where it was? Oh, this is where she went in, and well, this is where they always end up. So where's hers? There's no sign of it. What we've got here is a number of ad hoc experiments uh, done by police officers in a situation where the experiment should have been looked at very hard by a professional forensic scientist as to their validity to start with. Dr Clive Candy works with the independent research team Forensic Access. Trial and Error asked him to take a close professional look at the police's scientific efforts. Well, I suppose if it was me, I'd want to know all the details about the river before I was prepared to do any sort of experiment with anything. I would like to have seen uh, what sort of, sort of walking stick we might have been talking about, uh, different weights, different timbers, which might have a, a different bearing on the way the thing floated, up or down or flat on the water or whatever. Uh, all sorts of things should have been taken into consideration, uh, and not just piece of timber thrown into the river and just watched. A murder inquiry demands the highest standard of investigation. The police may play the forensic equivalent of poo sticks, but we wanted to talk to the country's leading specialists in the behaviour of rivers. At the hydraulics research station at Wallingford, they build vast scale models costing tens of thousands of pounds. This is the River Thames at Caversham. This model has been built to try to predict the effect on the floodplain of a proposed new bridge. We went to Wallingford to find out about the river breed. What effect does the nature of the terrain have on, on the flow of the river? Well, the biggest effect in this area is the, is the tidal effect because... What soon became so clear from discussions with the experts the was that the river breed doesn't behave so like ordinary rivers. Romney Marsh is reclaimed land, and at high tide the breed is actually below the level of the sea it's that meant to flow into. What the tide levels were at Rye on the day in question. These are the tidal gates at Rye. Our researchers at Wallingford and on the river itself have revealed that at the very time the police were noting that their walking sticks suspiciously didn't float away, these lock gates downstream were actually closed to hold back the seawater. Which meant that the walking sticks couldn't have floated away downstream. The river simply wasn't running. And just to show that you can prove anything with experiments like these, we actually managed to get a stick to float upstream, to the right, against the flow. By now it had become clear that much of the police's homespun forensic work had the scientific authority of the Beano Annual. All investigations rely on an element of luck. We were doing no better than the police in tracking down any motorcyclists Mrs Bolo claimed to have seen. We were on the point of abandoning the search when we stopped at this roadside cafe. Well, can I have two cups of tea and a piece of fruit cake, please? Right. Please. By the side of the hatch, behind some tatty protective plastic, was this poster. With little to lose except the price of a phone call, we rang the number on the poster. What we discovered was that May the 13th, 1992, the evening that Aunt Flo went missing, was a big night for the East Sussex Veteran and Vintage Motorcycle Club. It was the night of the club's annual fish and chip run. This is the 1994 event. Up to a hundred old bikes with various hangers on swarm through the Sussex countryside to a rendezvous at a fish and chip shop on the Hastings seafront. As darkness falls, they begin to disperse, often riding home in small groups. With old, unreliable bikes, some are slower than others. The custom is to wait at a convenient corner, like the hairpin bend for those going home to Rye or Folkestone, to pick up stragglers. Is this what Mrs Bowler saw? 
But even if there's now new evidence to support Mrs. Bowler's story of that night, there were still those witnesses who, as they rounded the hairpin, thought they'd seen the Audi with no one in it and Mrs. Bowler walking away. But let's look again at what the witnesses, in fact, could have seen. It was dark. This is the actual reconstruction we showed you earlier. And this is the actual car, Mrs. Bowler's 1979 Audi. It has solid headrests. You'd have every reason for believing that this car is empty, but it isn't. Our actress, by the way, is just five feet tall, the same height as Aunt Flo, and to cars coming round the bend, she's completely invisible behind those solid headrests. It didn't take much to knock down the prosecution evidence. In truth, it virtually fell over of its own accord, revealing the prejudice beneath. But trial and error's investigation had to go one step further. We were to discover the defence the jury never heard. The defence that Mrs Bowler never even knew she had. No one realised that Aunt Flo herself had the answer. To the police, Aunt Flo was a crime. To the lawyers, she was an argument. And even to those who loved her, Aunt Flo, for so long a woman full of vitality, had now become a source of anxiety. She and her sister Lil had come to rely on the help of others. I really can't remember exactly when they moved to the flat. They moved because Aunt Lil broke in her leg, fallen down the stairs. And basically, from then on, they went downhill. And although they were Dad's aunts, you know, Mum was the one who'd look after them. She'd go around in later on. I mean, she was going around, I think, twice a day just to check they're right. She'd go around first thing in the morning before she, work, before she went to work, and she'd go when she came back just to check, you know, almost to put them to bed. I don't know if she did, but she'd make them a drink or something. Well, she was the only caring person, very caring person, really, with the slightest uh, medical needs she'll send for me. She did all her day shopping. And she was very dedicated. For years and years, they could only survive because of the help of Mrs. Uh, Bola. Aunt Flo didn't want to go to a rest home. It was a decision taken in her best interests. But when we start to take decisions for the elderly, we can also take away their self-reliance. We lend them a helping hand and leave them dependent on us. We support them and take away their confidence, their balance, their self-assurance. We look after them so much that they, and we, forget that they can look after themselves. That's what seems to have happened to Aunt Flo. But Biddy Cole had been her next-door neighbour, and it hadn't always been like that. No, 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 she could certainly walk when we last saw her. This, of course, was before she went into the grave. Oh, indeed, I didn't see her at all once but she got to But did you say that she could, but before then she was adequately mobile? Oh, yes, mobile. yes, yes. I mean, I don't say she would have wanted to do the Highland Fling or anything particular, but, you know, certainly she could walk, and, I mean, I'd see her walking to the front gate because she would look for Sheila quite often too. But after the death of her sister Lil, living alone in the flat became increasingly difficult. One day, on a routine visit, Sheila Bowler found Aunt Flo in a dreadful state. It was obvious there was just no way she could cope when, you know, Mum found her in December. Of the year in a pool of blood, she just thought, this is crazy. And we all agreed what Dad said. It isn't safe for her to be there. She has to, she has to go into a home. She was discharged into the care of Greyfriars after 10 days in the local geriatric hospital. 89 years old and clearly shaken by her fall, hospital nurses and care assistants found that she needed a lot of help to get about. At trial, this evidence was to prove damning when everyone from Greyfriars agreed the old lady couldn't have walked to her death by herself. There is indeed a telling moment in the police interrogation of Mrs. Bowler when Detective Sergeant Booth confronts her with the evidence of the staff. And this is a lady we've heard from all sorts of people. I'll give you some quotes about what sort of people are saying about this lady's ability to walk. I've got all the staff up at the home mention how unable she is to walk. W.D.S. Booth may, as she says, have got all the staff at Greyfriars to mention Aunt Flo's immobility, but that may be more a tribute to W.D.S. Booth's thoroughness rather than to the medical facts of the case. Staff at Greyfriars may have thought that Aunt Flo was immobile, but they, as we'll see, weren't necessarily in the best position to judge. 
In fact, none of the evidence given at trial challenged the picture of Aunt Flo being totally immobile that night. Remember, even Mrs. Bowler herself thought that. Pointing going down there. I told you she can't walk. She's an old lady and she can't walk at all without a Zimmer frame. The defence accepted that Aunt Flo couldn't have made her way all the way along this road without help. And that essentially was the only reason why Sheila Bowler was convicted. With all the direct, factual and forensic evidence blown away, the judge felt it was still right to leave the jury to decide if Aunt Flo couldn't make it on her own, who else took her along this road and down to the pumping station? And that essentially was a puzzle that we too still had to solve. If I say something silly enough, you'll remember. <laughs> People who work regularly with the elderly all agree on one thing. They'll always surprise you with how much they can do. The Conquest Hospital in Hastings has a physiotherapy department specialising in encouraging the mobility of old people. 